This is section 10.3 of Honors Algebra 2, Composition and Inverses of Functions. So consider these two functions, f of x equals 3x minus 5, and g of x equals the square root of x. Functions are like machines. They have inputs and outputs. We usually call the inputs x and the outputs y. So that's the way the function notation works. f of x means my input is x, and it comes out as a value of y. So I input whatever I have as a value for x into my equation, work it out, get out a value for y. So let's consider the case where we have a machine inside of a machine. So here I've got the function g inside of my function f. So I put in my input, I put in my value of x, it goes into g, g does its thing to x, it comes out, transformed by g now, and it goes directly into f. f does its thing, and it comes out of f as my final y, that's my output. So it does g first, the output from g is the input for f, comes out, and that's my y. The way we depict this process mathematically is through what's called a composition of functions. We say f is composed with g, f composed with g, and write f of g of x, f of g of x. Notice that we start on the inside first with g. That's where x goes first. The output of g becomes the input of f. So for example, we'll take those same two functions, f of x equals 3x minus 5 and g of x equals the square root of x. Let's find f of g of 4. It means 4 is going to go into g first. So this is going to be f of g of 4 would be the square root of 4 because g of x is the square root of x. Well, the square root of 4 is 2. This is f of 2. f of 2 means I then plug 2 in for x in f. That's 3 times 2 minus 5, which is 6 minus 5, which is 1. So f of g of 4 is 1. All right, b, f of g of 2, same thing. g of 2 means the square root of 2. This is f of the square root of 2. Well, f of the square root of 2 means 3 times the square root of 2 minus 5. So it's just 3 radical 2 minus 5. I can't simplify that any further. So I can write an equation for the composition of functions. It creates a new function. So f of g of x is a new function in which I take the entire function g of x, which is the square root of x, and I plug it in for x into my function f. So this is going to be f of the square root of x, which means I'm going to take 3 times the square root of x and then minus 5. So that is my new function formed by the composition of f with g. d, I can also compose the other direction. g of f of 4 means I'm going to plug 4 into f first. Giving me g of, well, I plug in 4 for f, 4 into f, that'll be 3 times 4 minus 5. So that's g of 12 minus 5, which is 7. And g of 7 is the square root of 7. g of f of x means I'm going to take the entire function f of x, 3x minus 5, and plug it into g. So this is g of 3x minus 5. That means it's going to be the square root of 3x minus 5. That's my new function. Notice that f of g of x is not equal to g of f of x. Composing in opposite directions does not always give us the same thing. What is the domain of f of g of x? So the domain of this one over here on the left, well, I have to consider the domain of my original inside function. So the domain of g, the domain of g was that x would be greater than or equal to zero because I cannot have a negative number underneath the square root in g. So that means, and there's no limits on the domain of f, that's just a linear function. So the domain of f of g of x also has to be 0. The set of all x such that x is greater than or less than 0. It goes into g first, and that would cause a problem. Let's define the function i of x to be x. That means it's going to take a value of x and make it the output that same value of x. It's not going to do anything to the value of x. This is called the identity function. So 
So I stands for identity. The identity function takes a number and maps it to itself. So if I plug in 3, I of 3 is 3. I of pi is pi. For the operation of composition of functions, the identity function is like the number 1 for the operation of multiplication. When I multiply a number by 1, it doesn't change it. Well, when I apply the identity function to a number, it doesn't change it. So it fulfills that same role for this new operation that we formed by taking the composition of functions. Let f of x be x plus 4 over 2 and g of x be 2x minus 4. Let's find these two new functions by composing f and g. So f of g of x, I will take the entire function g of x, which is 2x minus 4, and I'm going to plug it into f. So it's f of 2x minus 4. That means I will replace x in f with 2x minus 4. So it would be 2x minus 4 plus 4 over 2. 2x minus 4 plus 4 is just 2x and then over 2 means x. So f of g of x is x. So it's the identity function. g of f of x means I'm going to take all of f and plug it into g. So I'll take x plus 4 over 2 and I'll take g of that. That means I will take 2 times x plus 4 over 2 minus 4. Where I replaced x in g with x plus 4 over 2. Alright, multiplying that fraction by 2, we'll cancel the 2 with the 2 that's in the denominator and just give me x plus 4. And then I've got minus 4 and x plus 4 minus 4 is x. Also the identity function. Whoa! Both f of g of x and g of f of x equal x, which is the identity function? Is this odd? Well think of multiplication. When two numbers have a product of 1, like 2 and 1 half, what do we call them? You might say reciprocals. Mm more general term for it are inverses. We say they are multiplicative inverses of each other. Same can be said for addition. 2 has a multiplicative, 2 has an additive inverse which is negative 2 which will add together to give you the additive identity. Well the identity in the operation of composition of functions is the identity function and it is possible for two functions to be inverses of each other so that when I compose them I get the identity. So a definition, the functions f and g are inverse functions if f of g of x equals x for all x in the domain of g and g of f of x equals x for all x in the domain of f. So if I compose the two functions in both directions and both times I get the identity function which would be just x then those two functions are inverses. The inverse of a function f of x is usually denoted f with a negative 1 of x, which we read as f inverse of x. The negative 1 is not an exponent. It does not act at all as an exponent. It is purely notation to denote the inverse of f. So let's graph those two functions that we just had. f of x equals x plus 4 over 2 and g of x equals 2x minus 4. So f of x equals x plus 4 over 2 is the same as saying f of x equals 1 half times x plus 4. Dividing by 2 is the same as multiplying by 1 half. So that's the same as having 1 half x plus 2. So that's just a linear function, y equals mx plus b, with a slope of 1 half and a y-intercept of 2. So if I graph it, it looks like this. And g of x is also a linear function with a slope of 2 and a y-intercept of negative 4. So if I graph that, it looks like this. So I've got f graphed in orange, g graphed in blue. Now you might notice something if you are an astute observer, that if I were to graph the line y equals x, which is the line that cuts straight through the coordinate plane at a perfect diagonal, that's the line y equals x, line with the y-intercept of 0 and a slope of 1. You might notice that those two lines I graphed, f and g, are mirror images of each other over that red line y equals x. Now, they don't look exactly like they're mirror images because I didn't draw them perfectly. I'm not perfect, I'm sorry. But they are mirror images of each other over the line y equals x. Coincidence? I think not. 
The graphs of inverse functions are always mirror images, which we call reflections of each other with respect to the line y equals x. Not all functions, though, have inverse functions. If the reflection of a function is going to be a function, then the original function must pass the horizontal line test, in addition to the vertical line test that it has to pass to be a function in the first place. So a function, remember, passes the vertical line test. If I pass a vertical line through it, it only crosses the graph once for every vertical line I could ever pass through it. The horizontal line test will tell us whether or not a function will have an inverse. If I pass a horizontal line through my graph, and every horizontal line I could potentially pass through it will only cross my graph once, then it passes the horizontal line test, and we call that function one-to-one, -one, and it has an inverse function. Okay? And that's because we need the reflection of it over the line y equals x to also be a function. So let's let f of x be x cubed minus 1. Does f have an inverse? And if so, find the inverse function and graph it. Well, I'll just see if it has an inverse. Let's graph that. x cubed minus 1. So if I plot some points, make my little chart. If x is 0, what's y? Well, it's negative 1. 0, negative 1 x is 1, what's y? Well, 1 cubed is 1, minus 1 is 0, 1, 0. If x is 2, what's y? Well, 2 cubed is 8, minus 1 is 7. So 2, 7, it jumps up really fast there. If x is 3, that's going to go off my graph. So let's try negative 1. If x is negative 1, negative 1 cubed is negative 1. Minus 1 makes negative 2. If x is negative 1, y is negative 2. All right? x is negative 2, what's y? Negative 2 cubed is negative 8, minus 1 makes negative 9. Negative 2, negative 9, all the way down there. That's enough for me to get a sense of the shape of it, and I can sketch it as a nice, clean, smooth curve. Many cubic functions will have graphs like that. So does this have an inverse? Well, let's check the horizontal line test. If I pass a horizontal line through this, Will it ever cross my graph more than once? No. So yes, it has an inverse. It is a one-to-one -one function. If so, find the inverse function and graph it. So how do I find the inverse function? Good question. Since the inverse is going to be a reflection over the line y equals x, I will get the inverse function if I just swap x and y. So originally I've got y equals x cubed minus 1. For the inverse, I'm going to switch x and y and make it x equals y cubed minus 1. And then I'm going to solve that for y. So that means x plus 1 equals y cubed. So y equals the cube root of x plus 1. So my inverse function, f inverse of x, equals the cube root of x plus 1. That's my inverse function. I switched x and y and solved it for y. Okay? Let's graph that inverse function. Let's make a chart. We know that it's going to be re the reflection over the line y equals x. So if I draw in that line and do an okay job with it, then this inverse if I've got the point 1, 0 on my original graph, I just swap x and y, I'll have the point 0, 1 on my new graph. So when x is 0, y is 1. If I had the point 2, 7 on my old graph, if I swap x and y, I'll have the point 7, 2. On my new graph, 7, 2, right there. If I had the point 0, negative 1, I'll have the point negative 1, 0. If I had the point negative 1, negative 2, I'll have the point negative 2, negative 1. If I had the point negative 2, negative 9, I'll have the point negative 9, negative 2. And this is the graph of my inverse function. Notice it's symmetric about that green line, the line y equals x. So I just swap the x and y coordinates of the original function. Pretty cool. Here are your immediate practice problems. Let g of x be x plus 1 and h of x be x squared plus 2. Find g of h of negative 3. 
So you're going to plug negative 3 into h, take the output from that, plug it into g, find h of g of 5, find g of h of x, so you're writing that new function, and find g inverse of x, the inverse of g, which is a one-to-one -one function. That is the end of section 10.3.